My name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Daryl Jonitas. Uh, it's November 4th, 2020. Daryl's home in Portland. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate this. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, first question for you to get us started is why wine? Why wine? Um, kind of a passion that grew out of spending some formative years in Italy and coming to a great appreciation for the marriage of food and wine on the table at dinner. And that has sort of guided me on a path that has bounced back and forth from Italy to Oregon um, over now probably 30 years. So. so tell us about what prompted you to go to Italy in the first place. Um, opportunity to study abroad when I was in college. Uh, I was at U of O and uh, the exchange program with Italy was um, a short summer program and I was in my senior year and uh, I'd studied Japanese for two years and could still not pronounce anything and a full year program in Japan wasn't looking attractive so I looked around to see what else was out there and um, Italy popped up and I've got an Italian heritage so I thought yeah let's do that um, and ended up in Perugia for a summer and spent many many weekends on side trips to other places and mm -hmm particularly Florence, um, where I fell in love with a concept and a restaurant that kind of inspired me from there to open my own place in Portland years later. Tell us about that initial kind of, initial concept, initial restaurant that you fell in love with. Yeah, so uh, it's called Aqua Al Due. It's still there to this day, although it's in its third location. <laughs> um, it started as kind of a little hole in the wall that only the locals knew about and you would kind of stick your head through a curtain late at night and ask if there was a chance to sit at a table and they'd tuck you into a corner and then every single course came out in multiples and they called it asagio, uh, asagiare meaning to sample um, and so they would send out a sampling of starters and a sampling of bruschetta and a sampling of pastas and a sampling of desserts and you get this great opportunity as somebody who's very young and not as experienced with all the different dishes of Italy or the region or whatever to taste lots of different things. Mm -hmm. um, and it was cheap and we were broke college students and there was wine on the table. So like, why wouldn't you go? <laughs> um, so it sort of became this little mecca of many of us students um, that summer to go there and try to get in after spending you know, a day roaming around Florence mm -hmm. or checking out the countryside. Um, so that, that was definitely something that stuck with me and kind of gestated in my head of opening a place in Portland someday or in the U.S. someday at that time, not really knowing where, but um, it wasn't surprising that I was drawn back to Portland. So, Talk about that in a second. I'm curious what drew you back to Oregon, but before that, I'm curious, uh, you talk about Italian wine on the table. Tell me about kind of your initial impressions. Did you have a wine background before that? No. Um, no. So like, you know, to take you all the way back to the beginning, I guess, my, my initial introduction to Oregon and um, my roots here. So moved here with my family in 1977. Uh, I was 10 and we moved to Bald Peak and um, lived up on the hill and we were brought here because my father's business transferred him to run a office of an insurance company in Portland and his business partners were one guy who's son would go on to open the most iconic restaurant in Portland that changed the entire history of dining in Portland, which was Bruce Carey from mm -hmm. Zephyro. Mm -hmm. And the other partner's ex-wife went on to become Dick Arath's second wife. Um, and was also a salesperson for Hinsdale Hill, Hins at the time, mm -hmm. um, which inspired my mother to get very involved with wine. Um, so we always had wine kind of around from that point. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I was riding the bus to and from school with Maria and Louisa Ponzi and kind of hearing what they were doing and hearing what her father was doing at the time and um, kind of got ingrained in a little bit of what was happening locally with wine. Um, but, you know, as a teenager, you're not drinking Pinot Noir. This is the 70s <laughs> and nobody's really um, talking about it yet. And I didn't really know what it was. Um, so it wasn't an inspiration for that. It was just maybe a little bit of an introduction to, oh, there's this lifestyle thing that exists within the wine industry and that might be interesting. Um, but really it was the Italian food and wine experience of being in Italy and seeing the regional differences that really lit a bulb in my head that said, wow, this is, this is something really deep and historical that's been going on for centuries that really appeals to me. Um, so just having grown up in a family that did appreciate food and wine, but in no way was like mm -hmm. 
hardcore on de you know on ingredients or I mean, my mother definitely did her best to try to work with vegetarian cooking at a time when it was maybe not popular um, health cooking mm -hmm. if you will mm -hmm. um, but you know the sophistication level and the access to mm -hmm. things you know they weren't burgundy collectors or anything like that so mm -hmm. um, but the bug was there and and so the culinary thing always kind of stuck with me mm -hmm. um, and then I ended up on a different path after college um, I mentioned the reason that I took this summer abroad program in Italy is it was a short one that fit within my senior year and the other thing that it coordinated well with is that the LSATs came the weekend before I had to leave whereas the MCATs were after and the GMATs were after and so I thought all right I guess I'll go to law school because <laughs> I could take the test so I took the test and then I got into law school and I ended up going to law school for some reason um, <laughs> <laughs> and so there was that little like detour um, and that brought me to Manhattan where I practiced for a couple years and my wife um, now at the time girlfriend um, and I would explore you know a lot of the better restaurants in New York City as well as the little dives and um, and getaways to you know upstate um, where we'd find random little old school Italian places and um, just kind of had this gestation period where we talked about, oh, wouldn't it be cool to do this? Oh, I, you know, I think I could do this. I could replicate this kind of a restaurant experience or something similar, but I could never afford to do it in New York, so let's get the hell out of New York. <laughs> so, and she was getting her MBA um, at NYU at the time, so the day she graduated, we had the U-Haul packed and got in the car and drove back across the country and ended up back in Portland in 92. Um, and at that point, you know, I knew it was going to be an Italian restaurant. I knew Italy was what I was inspired by, cooking-wise, eating-wise. Wasn't that educated on Italian wine, you know. When you're a young kid and you haven't really studied wine, mm -hmm. Italian wine's certainly not the most approachable starting point. Um, but I was, you know, enthusiastic about it. And so for me, my guide was Burton Anderson. He was a very, very well-known wine writer at the time. Um, he had published a book called Wine Atlas of Italy that had very in-depth, detailed information on each producer from every village throughout the country, as well as you know, what their production was, both in hectares, in liters, in actual bottlings, what the ones to look out for were, yada, yada, yada. So I kind of took that as my, this was gonna be my education. I wasn't going back to school at that stage in life after already having a grad degree. Mm -hmm. um, I just figured I'm going to teach myself, and so I used the book, and you know, started in Piedmont because that seemed natural. Um, couldn't afford Barolo or Barbaresco, and so I would find myself poking around the aisles on the weekends at Pasta Works, where like a 15-year-old Kevin DeGarma would come up with you know suggestions of what I should drink, <laughs> um, and yeah, you know, I started picking out you know Dolcettos and Barberas from producers that I had read were supposed to be very important. Uh, I wanted to learn about. And that kind of is how I continue to educate myself. And meanwhile, I was working in both front of the house and back of the house in restaurants um, and eventually helped open um, the kitchen at Three Doors Down, um, which is still there to this day in, on the Hawthorne area. Um, and that first summer working at Three Doors Down really helped kind of solidify a lot of my love for you know, Italian cooking and as well as the trattoria casual style of cooking mm -hmm. that we incorporated into our place. Um, and so that's summer of 94. Um, somewhere at that point, you know, I learned about a tasting that was taking place at the original liner in Elson. And so I put it on my calendar and I walked in and Bob and Matt were holding court with all of their regulars. And this guy in the corner wearing a suit was doing a presentation on like 15, 16 different um, single vineyard barbarescos, um, multiple vintages, and that was my introduction to Aldo Vaca, who, um, you know, at the time was still pretty new to coming to Oregon, but was coming two to three times a year. Um, and over the course of the 90s, I think if you talk to many people in the food and wine industry in Oregon who were active at that time, many of us refer to Aldo as the mayor of Portland, you know, the, or the mayor of Barbaresco, who, you know, was the ambassador to Portland. Um, but either way, he did so much to inspire many, many people to fall in love with Piedmont, fall in love with Italy, fall in love with Italian wines. 
Um, and at the end of the tasting, I had a quick chat with him and said, yeah, I was really interested in getting to Italy to try to you know, study and learn more before I opened a restaurant. He handed me his card. He said, if you do, let me know. Come stay. Come visit. Um, and that kind of opened a door. And so I used that and coordinated and ended up embarking on a two-month journey to Italy where I started in Tuscany and worked my way through places there and then ended up living for two and a half weeks at Protatory and uh, staging at, you know, really amazing restaurants that today I guess would be called Michelin star restaurants um, in the Piedmont Hills that Aldo would just connect me with the chef or just drop me off and say, yeah, this guy's going to show you risotto for the morning or, you know, you're going to you're going to see truffles come in. You're going to figure out how to clean mushrooms, whatever. Um, so that was awesome. And then at night we would go to you know, what are these iconic restaurants where Protatory had, you know, as an account, I mean, things work differently economically, but um, there's just a lot of like hospitality hosting going on for mm -hmm. the producers and them bringing in clients or friends or whatever. Um, and we would have these amazing four or five hour meals and drink, you know, historic bottles of wines. You know, first experience drinking wines from the 60s and 70s. Um, and this is already, you know, 95, mm -hmm. 94. Um, so that was really fun um, and just happened, you know, his stable of friends were Pietro Rotti from Renato Rotti Winery, Renato Vaca, his um, nephew or his cousin who was working in the cellar but went on to start Cantina del Pino, um, and Paolo Soracco who had just convinced his father to stop selling Moscato grapes to Martini and Rossi and try to make something that was more fine wine quality with sparkling Moscato da Asti. So it was just the beginning of that. Um, obviously that blew up, thanks to Kanye. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so like I was all of a sudden, you know, I'm hanging out with these guys, we're all the same age and kind of everybody's career has gone in very different directions, but um, those guys have all been super successful mm -hmm. and it's been really fun to watch. Um, and that's kind of kept me really tethered to Piedmont on many, many trips to Italy since. Um, and I came back to Portland inspired by everything I'd learned and um, we opened Asagio, our Italian restaurant in Selwood um, in the spring of 95 and, uh, sorry, 96. And that was, you know, we, we just got lucky. We hit the right location, the right time, um, the right neighborhood, the right need. and kind of an overnight success with lines around the block and it lasted for years and um, we were able to really do a lot because of that you know because we were so busy we were obviously constrained with time but at the same time we knew we had you know an audience and so we were able to try things mm -hmm. um, we were really focused on regional cuisine so we were doing monthly menu changes where we'd say all right we're doing Emilia Romagna this month so here's all the Emilia Romagna dishes and here's the Emilia Romagna wines we could find and we would keep this rotation going throughout the year and throughout many years, um, as well as throw special celebrations like a truffle fest where we'd fly in white truffles from Piedmont at $1,200 a pound and try to figure out how to get reimbursed, <laughs> at least for the cost of the truffles by shaving them on people's plates. Um, and that was great. Um, and that gave us another little following. Um, and a couple of years later, you know, after things were really rolling, we were still just slammed with business, we expanded. And our thought was, let's have an enoteca in the style you'd find in Italy, where people come, they just stand, they just have small bites, merende, um, a glass of wine, and then they leave. Totally didn't work. Portland wasn't ready for that. Um, so it turned into, you know, bar seating as well as waiting area for the restaurant overflow. Um, but we needed that. We were at that point where we were bursting at the seams. Um, but that was, you know, it was another opportunity to really expand the wine program. Um, and I kind of came out from the kitchen and. You know, I guess I kind of left out that along the way, like this whole process, I was really focused on being the chef as well as creating the wine list, but my wife was running the front of the house. Um, as, when we expanded, I kind of tried to step out of the kitchen and have a more structured kitchen staff that was doing the day to day. And I was really running the wine program and in front of the bar, you know, interacting with customers on wine, education. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really important to us that wine was accessible because we started as young kids, like we just wanted to drink wine, but we wanted it to be good, but we couldn't afford the expensive mm -hmm. stuff. So, you know, from day one, we had a $10 bottle of wine on every single table. And like, if you wanted the house wine, then you just got what we put on the table and we would rotate that and ended up being super successful way to educate our diners about Italian wines and all the differences and all the quality that was available. 
available at a reasonable price. Mm -hmm. um, and over the years, they grew with us. You know, their comfort at drinking a $10 bottle went up to a 30 or 40 or $50 bottle kind of as we continued to grow as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we were in a great neighborhood. I mean, lucky for us, um, John Paul from Cameron lived across the street, so we got to watch his kids grow up. And um, we had to stock Kinato because it's the only thing that his son Julian, Julian would drink. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it was kind of like, it was just a really good time. Um, and that was when I started networking a little bit with the Oregon wine scene more. I um, actually took Italian classes with Jay Summers and John Paul um, in the back of Pasta Works. And kind of at that point, kind of learned these guys were trying to do some Italian related things. Um, or they had that sensibility anyway, and Jay was still John um, assistant at that point. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and got to know Andrew Rich, also just as a neighborhood guy coming in and out, selling his wares. So even though we were a really strongly focused Italian wine list, we sort of branched out and did a little bit with domestic Italian varietals, and then just a couple people that we got to be friends with, um, and that kind of all of a sudden got me a little bit more interested in wine production rather than just consumption and learning and education and trying to you know memorize 1200 varietals and um, so so I set myself on a course to learn about winemaking and you know really be able to talk better to the customer was the goal it wasn't necessarily to start a winery um, but in 2001 I ventured down to Sonoma to work harvest and ended up working um, with at the imagery facility for the Benziger family, and then volunteering at Ravenswood and getting into the big open top redwood tanks to press off <laughs> amazing Old Vine Zinfandel. Um, and got to know some of the other Italians down there <laughs> who have, you know, obviously generationally now mm -hmm. um, grown grapes in Sonoma and Napa County, and uh, one of whom was Mick Unti, um, who he and his father had planted a lot of indigenous varieties to the Dry Creek area that hadn't quite, um, that concept hadn't really taken off yet and they were really one of the first and I was really enamored with what he was doing in his style. Um, and so I sort of signed up for, yeah, I'll be back in 2002, I'll come work for you and uh, keep this going and keep learning and I think we'll move to Sonoma and, you know, maybe embark on winemaking in America, but for me, the Italian thing was the draw and I didn't see that possibility in Oregon. Mm -hmm. um, and so we flash forward uh, about a year and we've made the decision to put our house on the market and we've made an offer on a house in Sonoma and our house sells in 10 minutes and the thing in Sonoma falls through and our staff tells us they're not going to run the restaurant if we're not in town. And we're like, well, that just doesn't work. So we ended up searching for property in the Portland area that had some acreage and some privacy. And we landed here um, on this half acre in the Northwest Cedar Mill neighborhood. Um, and I kind of decided, all right, well, I'm not going down to Sonoma. And two minutes before harvest started, Andrew Rich picked up the phone and said, hey, are you working harvest this year? I just found out I need to have my own employees to open the Carlton Winemaker Studio. I, they don't have a staff for me. Um, like, yeah, all right, sure. So I worked harvest with Andrew and I happened to be at Carlton the inaugural year. So we're next to Tony Soder and James and Lynn and Ron Penner Ash and Stuart and Athena Bodecker and Ann Hubach and Kelly Fox and Eric Homaker and you just kind of walk around all day going, what are they doing? What are they doing? And they're all making Pinot Noir and they're all doing something so completely different from each other. And that was a real eye opener. Um, and that was really fun to see how people are working with just one varietal and doing it so differently. Mm -hmm. um, but it also made me realize with that facility in particular that the concept of like a studio and a co-op was a great idea. But even with that, the amount of investment that was needed to kick off a small brand back in the early 2000s was pretty high. There wasn't a lot of quality small equipment available. Mm -hmm. um, it, it meant either signing on to a big rent scenario with a place that's co-op or you know outfitting your own place for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I just realized that I wasn't ready to do that and I wasn't inspired to do Pinot. I was really wanted to do Italian varietals, but I couldn't find any grapes that were being grown that were available. Mm -hmm. um, and so just kind of put it on the back burner and just said, all right, well now I know about production and I can talk better with customers about it. Um, 
So in the 2000s, we ended up, you know, hitting that peak with the restaurant where it was time to get out and we were exhausted and um, we were able to sell it and we got lucky that way. Um, and we spent about a year out of the industry feeling that pull like, well, we really miss like all of that interaction that you get in the food and wine world. Um, and so I decided to open a retail wine shop and that was uh, 2006 and it was called Cork over on Alberta Street. And from the get-go, I knew I was going to have a house brand, I was going to have my own white and red, we were going to try to, you know, buy or work production with friends so I could keep the cost down so I could sell really reasonably priced. You know, it's kind of the same thing I started with Asagio wanting a $10 bottle on the table. I wanted a $10 bottle of really good local wine. Mm -hmm. And this is back when there still wasn't a $25 or under local Oregon Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. So to try to find something that we could get that would hit this value point. Um, make it yourself, put your own label on it, get it out to your customer, build your own little following. That was the idea. Um, and so that kept me in production, which was great because I kept being interested in changes and what was going on. Um, in 2007, did a little side project at Apolloni for myself. Um, so the Viola label sort of got launched in 2002 when I worked with Andrew Rich. Well, it did, you know, it, it got launched in the sense of a label. Um, so I wanted to do my own wine. So in exchange for getting to work with him, I got to do my own little 25 case lot of Sangiovese. And I got some fruit from um, Alder Ridge Vineyard out in Horse Heaven Hills and was able to make a bottling, which sometime in 2004, we, we re released at our restaurant as just a little exclusive thing. And, um, you know, it was fun. It was a learning experience. And <laughs> it was a style of winemaking that I was learning at that time, which was really nothing like I ended up practicing later. But um, I think like everyone, you, you start with certain level of knowledge and then you evolve. Mm -hmm. um, so 2007, you know, kind of, oh, I should do that again. Got some Sangiovese out of Walla Walla this time. Convinced um, Alfredo to let me use a little corner of the winery to make a couple barrels of that there and sell that at the wine shop. Um, and this kind of kept happening, like, make something for a couple of years, take a couple of years off, you know, try to get the private label thing going. And then 2011, both of my private labels fell through. It was a really poor vintage here. There were a lot of challenges. Um, one of the people that was going to help me had facility issues and they were no longer allowed to do what they had thought they were going to be able to do. And so I ended up with new wine and having a shop that was kind of really vibrant at the time. I felt like I can't really afford for this to happen again. Mm -hmm. I should take more control. Mm -hmm. So in 2012, I went out and said, all right, I'm gonna contract for my own fruit to try to make my red and my white. Um, but if I'm gonna do that, I might as well make a couple things in addition to that. So I sort of like started out with like four or five wines, rented some space at Bodecker in Northwest and did a true custom crush where I was involved, I was there mm -hmm. um, making the wine and bottling the wine and Walked out of that feeling like, yeah, I think I could do this and I could balance this at, you know, a few hundred cases along with all of my duties as a retail wine shop owner um, and just keep it small. But I have this garage that I'm not using and I shouldn't really be paying rent. I should just do this on my own. So <laughs> the space that we're sitting in today um, became the Viola Bonded Winery in 2013. Basically, you know, we were lucky we had the structure here. We just needed to pour a crush pad and put in a drain and uh, add some, you know, power and water that wasn't here and uh, make it happen. And so we crushed our first crush here by backing the pickup up and setting up a folding table and having 15 friends come and, you know, sort through with buckets and hand dump it into a distemmer and, you know, old school. Um, it didn't take much. Um, and then, you know, over time, we even incubated a few other brands that came in here and they wanted to learn how to make wine, so they would help and then they would make a barrel or two and, um, you know, one of them's gone off and started a pretty good, successful four or 5,000 case production winery now. Um, and we just kind of liked the small scale of things mm -hmm. and were able to really focus on, I don't want to say fruit forward, but I want to say Wines that could be consumed when they were young, so they didn't require a lot of cellaring. We don't have space to age things over. So at the most, I would barrel over a barrel or two. Um, and otherwise, everything was bring it in, crush it in the fall, start bottling in the spring, finish bottling by August, and try to be sold out of almost all of it by the end of the year. 
Um, so it was on a very quick cycle, mm -hmm. and I intentionally tried to make wines in a style that fit that, having had a lot of years of drinking and enjoying <laughs> different things from Italy that n weren't necessarily being made in America or weren't the style that um, American wines typically fall into. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of stainless reds. Um, most of my barrel aging was with white program. Most of my skin contact of extended macerations was with whites. Um, and that was, you know, it wasn't as fashionable as it is today. Mm -hmm. um, there were just a few of us that were sort of playing around with that. Mm -hmm. um, and we managed to take this 500 square foot space and crank out a thousand cases a year for about five years. And it was, you know, it was a challenge. It was fun. Um, but along the way, you know, I discovered great vineyards in the Columbia Gorge. Mm -hmm. And I kept going back to the gorge. And so that was really my home base during harvest where, you know, I would have to be out there and have to be checking all the time. We started camping out there. We started putting a, um, you know, a trail around one of the vineyards so we could camp a little bit closer to the source. <laughs> and then we ended up buying property out there. And then we thought we should probably build a facility so that we can make the wine closer to the source. Um, and you know, we can use this for storage and distribution in Portland. Um, so we did that in 2018, we built a structure um, and we kind of ran out of steam and took the year off in 2019 and thought, okay, we'll move everything out for 2020 harvest. Um, we'll build the house so we can live in the house. But um, in the meantime, we lived in the garage that was supposed to be the winery. Um, and then, you know, like, the industry is a challenging industry to be in. So for a lot of different reasons, we had already decided we really wanted to scale down, um, focus on just hand selling to the people we really enjoy working with, as well as the direct to consumer thing, um, and get out of trying to do national distribution and trying to be in multiple markets at the scale that we were at just didn't make sense. Um, but then COVID hit and I just happened to be lucky at the time of not having very much inventory because I was planning on a move and I had planned on empty mm -hmm. tanks and not full barrels. Um, and so, you know, I think the writing was just there that uh, this is a good time to take a pause. So we sold out of everything this summer and just decided to shut down operations for good and not renew licenses and not try to get new licenses and bonds out of the new facility. And uh, we'll just see what happens, I guess, now. Mm -hmm. um, we cleared a half an acre that we hope to plant with some kind of interesting indigenous Italian varietal that is not or barely present in the Northwest. And we may still do that. Um, and if we do, that'll kind of give us a four to five year timeline to be ready to make wine again. And as you know, wine doesn't make itself overnight and it doesn't like, it's not like a two week beer process, like now it's bottled and ready to go. Like, so, you know, six or seven years out looks about the right time at this point, and that might be just appropriate for the environment that we're in. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of running you up and down the whole wow. basics. Of every part of it. the wine industry, like every every different part of it. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Well, so I want to back up a second and fill in some fill in a couple questions here with uh, talking about Asagio and talking about kind of hitting at the right time. I'm curious about. You talked about wine education being a big part of what you wanted to do there. I'm curious about yeah. the sort of the level of wine knowledge, especially of Italian wine knowledge that you found and the amount of interest people had in Italian wine at that point in Portland in the, in the 90s. Yeah, um, so like I said, um, you know, really fortunate to get to meet Aldo Vaca at an early age and, um, you know, make a connection with him. And he really was the ambassador to Piedmont at the time. And he was coming to Portland regularly and he was bringing his friends and telling his friends it's a great market to sell wine in. And we had this small group of importers that were doing direct importation um, of Italian, Italian wines. And you know, most notably Admiralty, where Greg Zancanella was running the show and Todd Bacon was the second in charge. And the two of them went off to you know, Zancanella importing and Todd now, to this day, runs the Italian division for Young's Columbia. Um, and they were both very instrumental in bringing in brands directly. Um, and there were other players along the way who came and went. Um, but what that created was a wonderful opportunity to get to know the producers because they had direct relationships so they would come to see their suppliers mm -hmm. as well as keeps the cost down so you can really compete with local wines or California wines at the time, I guess, was really the inexpensive domestic alternative or French but French didn't really have a play in, in Oregon or in Portland. Um, and so Italian wines were just huge. I mean, we were, we were probably, we were the number two market for Italian wines through most of the 2000s. 
and we're about the number 26 market population wise. Mm -hmm. So that's a massive amount of consumption of one product category that doesn't necessarily fit. But there's so many similarities between Oregon and Italy, um, and and even or Oregon and Piedmont um, with truffles and hazelnuts and the topography um, and the variation that we have in the gorge is so similar to what you find between Friuli and the Dolomites and Piedmont and Valdosta. Um, all these tiny microclimates caused by volcanic ranges and you know Missoula floods and all of that um, kind of creates a very fertile area and the artisan movement was really just getting going and as all of that kept going, Italian wines always fit. Um, you know, someone starts making salami, hey, let's get some Italian wine. Somebody starts making cheese, Italian wines work. Hey, there's a new pasta guy in town, Italian wines work. I mean, it just kind of kept happening over and over again and perpetuated itself. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that led me to just keep learning and getting to know more people and going on trips regularly to different regions. So over the course of 10 years of having the restaurant, um, we made multiple chip trips and probably, you know, to this day, there's only two regions in Italy I've never been to. Um, and we made a point of like, okay, yeah, we know Tuscany sells, we know Piedmont sells, we, you know, we know even Valpolicella sells, but let's go to those other places. Let's, let's explore Puglia. Let's see what's happening in Molise. You know, who's drinking wines from Vesuvia? You know, that, that kind of thing. Um, and then come back and share that. So we did a lot of education at the restaurant. We had classes, we had tastings, we had producers come and do, you know, historic library tastings. Um, and I continued that at the wine shop with, you know, we built a 14-seater back room table with a small kitchen. Uh, when we started off, I would just invite friends who were chefs to come in and cook dinners, and then I would do the wines and pair it and whatnot. I mean, we were kind of lucky we launched, you know, we, we were the pre-launch dinner for 1001 that Adam Berger from Tabla started um, with Erica Landon, ended up running the wine program there. We were the pre-launch dinner for Toro Bravo. The first time that John Gorham and Casey ever cooked together was the day they showed up to prep for the dinner at our place. Um, <laughs> we didn't know what was going to happen from there. Um, Robert Reynolds, who was an iconic uh, educator in the Portland area of, of chefs, um, mm -hmm. cooked dinners regularly. Amelia Hard, who was a good friend and old neighbor of Asagio, um, came and cooked, cooked dinners, did classes with me. Um, and Renee Erickson from Boat Street came down. This was long before any of her empire had started. And um, I'd gotten to know her through an Italian distributor who was friends with her in Seattle. And, you know, it was just like really a wonderful um, marriage of let's showcase all the things that we know. Let's really try to do a lot of Italian things and let's kind of keep educating consumers mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. um, and Italy's just difficult. So Italy needs so much more hand holding than France. You know, you've got the French system, the AOCs, the limitations on varietals, the vast um, land that is dedicated to monovarietal. Mm -hmm. And in Italy, it is so exactly the opposite. You've got a tiny little village that has 13 indigenous varietals you've never heard of, and um, they're making you know 75 different types of wines with them, doing them, vinifying them different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and so that for me is always exciting. I mean, I love change, and I love things that are different, and I love to kind of go down those rabbit holes. And mm -hmm. so um, sharing that was, has always been a part of everything that we've done um, in the industry, yeah. So you mentioned oh, that a lot of the, for the, both the, the cooking and the wine were both kind of, you, you kind of learned on the fly. There wasn't a lot of formal education there. Tell me about the, about the process of teaching, teaching yourself to cook the way you wanted to cook and of, and of learning a wine list well enough that you could build a wine list in a restaurant and, and be and educate and, and, and grow in that way? Sure. Um, from the food standpoint, it was, you know, the typical, I mean, I, I worked in some kitchens, so I got to see and learn some technique that was, you know, essential. And then cookbooks, um, you know, just would delve into anything that was out there. Um, but the classics, you know, Marcella Hazan, I mean, working my way through the essentials book, even before I opened the restaurant, just to figure out the basics. Um, we were really fortunate in the late 90s, Marcella's son opened a restaurant in Portland and was cooking here for about a year. 
and she came and did a class, so I was able to take that and kind of get some firsthand experience of her and um, <laughs> what she's like and her take on some of these, these recipes and her take on how Americans are and how Americans cook, and that was, that was illuminating. Um, and then Carol Field, who really had pioneered baking in America and you know the reason that we have ciabatta and pugliese and things that you're really familiar with on the shelves of every you know, now a grocer and, you know, artisan baker is because Carol Field went to Italy and researched these recipes and brought them back in their, you know, basic form and shared them in a way that American bakers could cook. Um, and so I had, you know, used that book as the basis for our whole bread program. Um, we did everything from scratch back then. We, there weren't really suppliers around, except Grand Central had just started. And since Carol had worked with them to get their recipes going, I used them as kind of my backup baker when we couldn't bake enough when we were too busy. Um, but then I had the chance to go to CIA in Napa and spend a week cook, cooking and learning from Carol. Um, and also, with the focus on scaling these home recipes that she had done for commercial use, um, which was really, really helpful to grow the bread program. Mm -hmm. um, and I just sort of, that was sort of the natural thing. So I took the same course with wine. I mean, it turns out Martella's husband, Victor Hazan, was a very well-known Italian wine writer. He had put out several books. Um, in English, so we were able to read those and learn about people. And um, I think I mentioned Burton Anderson earlier, who was really influential and had a chance to have a lovely meal with him in Tuscany one time that we were visiting and, and get some insights into the industry and how that all worked um, and how he went about and found these micro producers and would highlight them. And um, I think I kind of just used these ideas as ways to continue myself when I would go to a region or a town or a friend would say, hey, go, go, go visit these guys and you're there and you, well, who else do you like? You know, what else is going on here? Oh, my cousin's doing this or you gotta go over here and check out what, you know, my sister-in-law just started this. And so it, it, a lot of word of mouth, but then you internalize that knowledge and then you figure out how that applies to the consumer mm -hmm. and what they can get. You know, I mean, you have to really start with well, these are the only bottles available. There's no reason to have, you know, a two-hour talk on something that is intangible because mm -hmm. that's not usually what people gravitate towards. So, you know, we would look at the assortment available and then we would kind of focus on the stories from there. And then if the stories were really intriguing, my wife and I would go because we, we really want to see this firsthand. And mm -hmm. um, oftentimes we'd form relationships that just lasted forever. And mm -hmm. um, sometimes bring those people back to share their stories firsthand with our customers and uh, it just sort of kept going that way. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was, there was no formal education, it was just learn by everyone else who you know, is in America or speaks English and is publishing in English that I can read. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So you talked about the, the kind of complication of Italian wine versus French versus other places that have Tell me about when you're educating uh, in Italian wine, what, how do you simplify it for the consumer, for the person who wants to be educated, to a point where they're learning but they're not overwhelmed by the variety? That's a great question. It's, it is really hard to do that and I think for me I always try to micro focus. So like if we're going to do Piedmont and we're going to do Barolo and Barbaresco, ideally we're going to do those on different days. Um, but if we're going to even do them in one class, you know, we have to do everything with visual aids. You know, back then we didn't, we didn't even have laptops or, you know, we, we had computers, but we didn't really have the ability of doing small projected images. So we would print out a map and then we would try to take people through. Um, I think geography is so important to the education of wine. And when you can get people to at least visualize, okay, there's this little town in the middle of a valley, Alba. And there's these two hillsides, Barolo and Barbaresco, that are on opposite sides. Because they're on opposite sides, their formations happen differently, and geologically they have different soil types. But climate-wise, they're in the same zone, so they grow the same thing. Um, and then you can relate them to, you know, have you ever been to McMinnville? And you can see where, you know, Shehala Mountain's here, and Dundee Hills is there. And they can kind of orient themselves to, all right, it's something like this that I've been to. Or, you know, Napa and Sonoma is always a really good example because there's that delineation of the Mayakamas that changes the coastal influence that Sonoma gets that Napa doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, from a wine tourism standpoint, so many people have been to that region. So that always worked well as a tool to kind of educate 
Um, but to not overwhelm people, you know, we would always really limit the, the number of bottles and the number of varietals um, and, and try to do it that way. Mm -hmm. So between uh, Asagio and, and Cork, you're obviously bringing in a lot of interesting Italian wines and, and some others as well, but I'm curious, um, were there places you kept going back to or were you kind of always looking for the next, the next thing? You're talking about kind of the network of, you find a person and then you find out what they like and they find out what they like. Right. Were you always kind of looking for a new thing or did you find a kind of a comfort zone for those places? I think it, it's the nature of my personality to always be looking for something new. Um, and you know, I guess I was lucky in a sense that the younger consumer is also that way. So that worked out really well for my retail shop. Um, and when I started Cork, you know, I really had no experience aside from a very limited knowledge of the Rhone um, and a decent knowledge of California. I had very limited experience on the rest of the world of wine. So that opened the door for me to educate myself about France and Spain and Germany and Austria and Argentina and Chile and you know lesser extent New Zealand and Australia, um, but really explore the whole world of wine and constantly find new things. Mm -hmm. um, so so that's getting sprinkled in now with the Italian stuff and the local stuff. And obviously, as a local retail wine shop, all of a sudden I'm selling a whole lot more Oregon wine. Um, that's a key part of our program. So mm -hmm. really getting to know lots of local producers. Um, and seeing what's happening here in the scene. And, and I think that really also was a big motivator for me to become a producer because all of a sudden there was a dynamic shift in the late 2000s where a producer shows up who's actually making wines in the style I would find from Europe. Um, and you know the two, two biggest examples for me that I always felt spoke to me that, hey, they kind of nailed it, this is what you should be doing. Um, is Teutonic and Barnaby's wines being very Germanic and intentionally, you know, labels, everything, like just really getting it, mm -hmm. as well as Division mm -hmm. and what they started doing with um, even the, mostly the, the Village wines. Like I just mm -hmm. love that we're going to do, you know, the table wine thing for um, Oregon wines. And I thought, this is great. Nobody's doing this with Italian wines. You know, I keep having these clunky, overripe, big California style, you know, the Calital style that really <laughs> died in the 80s, but was still alive. Um, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't seeing people doing fresh, young. I mean, m my love of Italian wines was the introduction to Dolcetto, um, sitting in a bar in Barbaresco in 1995, and we're drinking the 1994 vintage, and it's three months old. Um, we wouldn't see that vintage in the U.S. for two to two and a half years because that was the process of importation, of release dates, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and all of that. Um, and yet, the Italians were never drinking anything that was like older than a year or two. You know, those were really special wines. They would say for special occasions, but otherwise, they're drinking table wine, and it's that same wine that you know everybody goes on vacation and they go to Italy and they say, "Oh, I had the best wine at this little trattoria in the middle of nowhere, and it had no name, and I didn't get a headache, and whatever." Um, <laughs> But that's because it was just super young and fresh and straight out of the tank and unadulterated and pure. And I loved that. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what I tried to do with Viola and tried to do it all without adding yeast, without adding anything, without filtering and, you know, have it not explode in the bottle once we released it. And for the most part, we were successful. Yeah. <laughs> So would you say, you, you just described kind of the wines that you fell in love with, would you say, how would you, if you could find a common factor among the wines that you fell for outside of Italy, is there a commonality through the or Oregon and, and other European and South American and other wines that you found, is there a common factor among them, the wines that have appealed to you? I think the wines that appeal to me are, you know, what I would, would classify 10 years ago as European in style meaning lower alcohol, brighter, more vibrant fruit, really high acid. I mean, to me, what defines an Italian wine is its acidity, um, not its varietal. And the varietal character always shows through, but that's because it's not masked by winemaking and the acidity is there. Um, and that's something we often lose. We, we, we lost, I think, in America for a long time because of the education that was being pushed on winemakers at Davis. That was not the style of wine that they were trying to get people to make because they didn't know whether that wine could be made from younger vines grown in America successfully on a commercial basis. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense. Um, it just didn't appeal to me. 
So I wanted to see, you know, how do we how do we emulate these amazing, you know, terroir examples with what we have here in raw materials. Mm -hmm. And it was, I guess my approach to wine kind of became the same as my approach to food. It's like I learned Italian cooking, which is all about the ingredient, and the ingredient is usually one, and it's like an eggplant dish. So you <laughs> add eggplant, and then a little bit of a couple other basic things, but you, you know you're eating an eggplant dish. Mm -hmm. um, and it's same thing, like let's not throw a whole bunch of stuff into this, let's just have the one varietal, let it show itself. Does it taste like it tastes when it's grown in the hills of, you know, somewhere in Italy or not? Um, not that that is a defining characteristic, but I feel like varietal character is so incredibly strong for the most part that it really does shine through if you don't get in the way of it with the winemaking. And so I, I've always gravitated towards winemakers that think that same way and, mm -hmm. and do a job of kind of allowing the grape to speak for itself and doing the work in the vineyard. And I know these things are really cliche to say, but um, they really are important. So, yeah. <laughs> cliche for a reason, yep. cliche for a reason. Uh, let's talk about viola a little bit. I'm curious, first of all, uh, the story behind the name. Why did you choose the name of viola? Yeah, so viola is my Sicilian family name. Um, so Giuseppe Viola was my great grandfather and he immigrated to the United States at the turn of the last century. So 1899, came over on a ship. Um, and met my great grandmother in New York after his first wife died in childbirth. And uh, together, I think they had 16 children, so 13 of which lived to adulthood. Um, my grandma was in the middle. Um, and I never met my great grandfather, but um, have strong memories of going to my great grandmother's house and the raviolis drying on the bedspread. Um, <laughs> And the family's gathering, and um, and you know, I guess a little bit of that romanticism of the Italian thing, and I wanted to honor that. And you know, I feel like that's that's the part of my heritage as a classic American mixed <laughs> ethnic background mm -hmm. um, that really resonates with me. And um, so it was an easy choice, and Sicilian family lineage, so you know. It, necessitated a trip to Italy to do some research. So that was good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's, that's a nice excuse. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm curious about the, the process of, of production. Obviously, it was like one of the last things you got to in kind of your wine journey. Yeah. Uh, by that point, you had a lot of experience. You'd seen a lot of places. I'm curious when it came time to actually make your own wine. Well, were there any surprises? Was there anything about the process that surprised you or that you found more or less appealing than you anticipated? Yeah, the process is definitely daunting. Um, and, you know, again, I, I didn't go through the classic education steps of, you know, work harvest, then become a seller master, seller rat, then become an assistant, see the whole process year in, year out. Um, I had only worked harvest. And I had been involved in, you know, two full-time harvests, two part-time harvests, and volunteering, you know, days or weeks here and there over a decade, mm -hmm. but that's it. So I really understood fermentation with a comfort level that, yeah, okay, we can do this, no problem. I had <laughs> no idea what to do when harvest ended. So the first year here in this facility, we just had to figure it out. It's like, oh, I guess we have to rack now. Oh, um, you know, when you rack, you have to do this first. Or um, how do you bottle? How do you get it from point A to point B? How do we come up with systems that are going to work? Um, and I love problem solving and I love building. So it was really fun to figure out how to do that and then get the right equipment to do it. And, um, you know, I got lucky in finding a bunch of equipment from a small winery in Woodenville that went out of business um, that was like kind of all my production equipment for harvest, and then another small winery um, in Portland who decided to move and sold off his bottling equipment. And so those two things kind of filled in a lot of the blanks, and then I just had to figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, but you're, you're kind of wrestling that along with how do I make the style of wine I want to make, and you kind of know what people have done. I mean, I would go to a winery and say, I love this, you know, rosé, how do you do it? Oh, 24 hours on the skins, and we press it off, then it's in stainless, and then we rack it, then we bottle it, and then we send it out. All right, great. So, you know, you mental note, write it down, then you want to try it. But it doesn't go the way you want it to necessarily. <laughs> so, um, and especially when you're using, you know, really minimal, any kind of additions or adjustments or even sulfur um, to kind of keep things somewhat stable. Um, 
So you learn. You just have to learn on the fly, you know, or you ask friends, or you read. Um, but you know, sort of, it's it, there's a lot of intuition. There's a lot of art. I always say that I gravitate much more to the art than the science. You know, I, I don't have a science or a chemistry background. Um, so I learned to do enough in the lab to, you know, pull out my own bricks and pH and um, send things out when I need more information and, you know, call in friends when you have problems that you can't solve and a uh, great community here. And obviously having been a retailer as well as um, a small producer locally. I've gotten to know a lot of people, so sure. that was really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Let's talk about that part of it too. I mean, obviously, you had plenty of experience selling wine at this point, but I'm curious, when you start selling your own wine, how different is it? Yeah, it's totally different. Um, I feel like what gave me the confidence to do it in the first place was that I did have a lot of relationships already, um, you know, as one of the better wine shops in town. I was carrying a large assortment of things which got me invited to many distributor and importer tastings that would happen within the industry to keep people up to date on new things. And there I would be networking with the buyers at other restaurants and shops. So I'd gotten to know a lot of people. Um, so it really wasn't, it wasn't as intimidating as it could have been to start out that first day with those first two bottles and walk out to people I don't know and knock on the door and try to show them. At least I could, op you know, mm -hmm. at least they open the door for me and say, oh yeah, how are you? Oh, you have wine to taste. Oh, all right, I'll taste it, you know. <laughs> and then if they liked it, it worked out. Um, and I, my production was really small, so in the beginning with a couple hundred cases, you know, I'm only gonna go out a couple days a year show the wines, find a few people that want them, sell through it. Mm -hmm. um, when you scale up, it's really interesting because you know we talk a lot, or if you're learning about the wine industry and how it works and the economics of the wine industry, um, you know, scale is, is so integral and economies of scale um, are also really important. And there's a really fine line between 300 cases and 2,000 cases. And that sounds like a really big number, but it's, it's somewhere in that three to 500 range, and then you kind of have to get over 2,000, and then you have to get to 10,000, mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and pushing the envelope to try to do 1,000 out of this space so I could keep my overhead low um, created a lot of other issues in terms of all of a sudden I have too much wine that I don't have enough time to go sell it myself. I have to involve other people. Mm -hmm. Then I have to go support the other people, and then sometimes the other people either aren't doing a great job or aren't paying their bills. Um, and it's a challenge of the industry, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and so you end up running after a lot of the business aspect and a lot less of the wine as wine making aspect. Mm -hmm. um, and sales in multiple channels is really challenging. So um, I think for me, the most enjoyable part was when I was selling directly to the wine buyer at a restaurant or a shop, as well as to the consumer and much less enjoyable when I was running around in another market with a distributor. Meeting their accounts was great, but then the business aspect of it mm -hmm. um, kind of becomes just a nuisance, which it shouldn't. Um, as somebody that's run my own small business for 25 years, like, you know, you need product, you bring it in, you pay for it, you produce something, you send it out, you get paid for it. That's just kind of how it works. But the wine industry is strange and different, and our timelines are different because people are used to these, you know, lag times of, you know, how long it takes for the grape to produce, how long it takes for the wine to be ready for sale, and then how long that should be in the marketplace. And those are really long timelines. They're not your traditional 30, 60, 360 day mm -hmm. cycles. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, yeah, so I, I hadn't really put thought into that. I was just like, oh, this is going really well. I did 300 cases last year. Let's do 600 this year. And okay, let's do 900 next year. Okay, what's all that wine sitting there in the corner? You know, like how do we how do we get our head around this problem? Um, and yeah, so it you, you definitely have to pick and choose, and then be ready to jump to the next level if you really want your business to grow, or be comfortable with. I'm happy just making this much, whether it's you know bottles or money or whatever it is mm -hmm. that you know is going to feed you and satisfy you, and not keep pushing yourself down a path that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So obviously you've you've worked with a lot of different Italian varietals. I'm curious about as it came time to make wine, how did you choose what to make, and, and as you grew and there were more options, how did you decide which of the varietals you wanted to make? and which you wanted to plant for yourself as, as, the, as the time came. Sure. Um, 
So in the beginning, you know, 2012, I decided I'm gonna do this. Um, I've already made Sangiovese twice, so I'm looking really hard for other things. Um, in 2002, when I was working for Andrew Rich and um, he was buying grapes from Alder Ridge and that's when I was able to get some Sangiovese from there, I had spied Barbera um, and it was the most beautiful looking fruit of like all the fruit that I went out there that harvest to go, you know, pick and, and get for whether I was trucking it back for Andrew or I was getting my own Sangiovese and checking on the fruit and running numbers and going by this Barbera going, this stuff looks great. And like um, calling the um, vineyard manager there for about a decade, literally, just like every two or three years, oh, I wonder if they have any Barbera. Oh, I wonder if they have. And then in 2012, they said, yeah, our Barbera, like some of the Barbera came up for contract. Um, they had 40 rows, so it's tiny. Um, Alder Ridge planted a test bench <laughs> down right off of the Columbia, and they put in, I don't know, like 150, 200 varietals, because at the time, nobody knew what Horse Heaven Hills was about. They didn't know what would grow. They didn't know what people would want, and they figured this way at least we'll have some vinifera cuttings and we can, you know, expand from there. Um, and fortunately, by 2012, they had not ripped out the Barbera. The original Sangiovese I'd used had been torn out for something else. Um, but the Barbera was 40 rows on, you know, sustainable farming that was tested for organic farming, um, hand harvesting, you know, very different from all of the rest of their program, but fit mine. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was able to contract up front for six rows for a couple of years, and that was like, all right, that gets me going. What else do I need? So um, I was able to find some Pinot Blanc um, from the Valley um, that some friends were also working with and was able to make some Pinot Bianco from that and then figured I'd fill it in with some hardier red, um, some Zinfandel, and found some growing in the, um, high, the high elevation site in the Dalles on the edge of the Columbia Gorge AVA, so the, the easternmost edge of the AVA, um, which is Volcano Ridge. Mm -hmm. um, and so that kind of got me started, um, and so that was gonna give me a stainless red, a barrel-aged red, and a white, and I figured we'd go from there. Um, and then and we did a little blend with the two reds, um, but that was about it. Um, from there, that was successful. Then I was coming here and then I was like, well, I really need what's missing for me, which I love the most, which is aromatic whites. So I had been sort of already hounding a couple people who grew Old Vine Gewürztraminer because I knew that was a possibility in the gorge, um, but everybody kept saying no. And so um, in having a conversation with Steven at Analemma, he mentioned that there was a grower in Hood River that had some Sauvignon Blanc that was being organically farmed and maybe I should go talk to her. And I was like, great, you know, like that's something widely available and certainly there's Sauvignon growing in Friuli and um, that would at least give me a start and it's an aromatic white that I like. And I pulled up to this vineyard called the Allegre Vineyard in Hood River and they had their quarter acre of Sauvignon Blanc at the upper block and a full acre at the lower block. And the other varietals they had planted were Pinot Grigio, Moscato Giallo, and Dolcetto. So it was just this magical moment where I fell into a site at a scale that matched what I was doing with a grower that had the same kind of philosophy and focus um, and varietals that fit my program. And so over the course of the next couple of years, I kind of took over all of the fruit from Allegra Vineyard and made wines with all of those grapes as varietals, as blends, um, as rosé, as, you know, whatever. Uh, we played, we had a lot of fun, and, and I worked really closely. I mean, I was out there many times throughout the year, and then, you know, many times throughout harvest, as well as their picking into baskets, sorting in baskets in the field, in order to make this space work. Mm -hmm. um, that was really essential to getting exactly the result I wanted, and also, an easy way to process it back at the winery without a bin dumper or mm -hmm. we had a forklift to offload, but that's it. So, um, and so, so now all of a sudden I've got Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Grigio, Moscato Giallo, Pinot Bianco had fallen off, um, but I get a phone call right before harvest the next year, right when I've decided to take on all this other fruit that a few rows of this old vine Gewürztraminer is available. So I had to jump on that um, and make something that, you know, I tried to emulate the Traminer Aromatico from Trentino where the grape, or where Alto Adige, where the grape originally comes from um, and is often done in this very dry, high acid style that you don't see so much in America. Um, and that was a great fit. Um, and then 
a friend of mine that, or a, a relationship that I made from the wine shop was with a grower in Walla Walla who started his own little brand and started making a couple hundred cases of Cabernet. Um, and his wife came to the Portland market to hand sell it herself. And the wine just fit really well with our program at Cork. We didn't have a good value, really quality Cabernet from Walla Walla. Um, and our customers ate it up. And so we became good friends because they were coming very regularly to deliver wine to us. And then they're like, yeah, you know, we planted Barbera, Nebbiolo, and Sangiovese, and we don't really know what to do with it. And I was like, oh. So this led to a longer conversation, and we sent them to Piedmont, and they walked vineyards with friends um, and got some education about what they were growing and how. And I was like, well, now that you know all this, I guess we really should work together. So we ended up buying Barbera, all three varietals from them for a couple of years um, and playing with those. So we kind of filled our, you know, bigger red varietals or barrel age red program, our lighter, fresher, um, and then the aromatic whites. Um, so, so we tried to stay in the gorge, but it was hard to find it. Uh, honestly, we can find all the whites we want at this point. It's hard to find red growers who are interested in growing sustainably or organically with red grapes. I don't know why. I don't know if they, there's just too much challenge with a longer grower se growing season or it's just the philosophy of the people that have planted those vineyards isn't the same. Um, but that's, that's what we always found ourselves going outside of the zone for. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think today, you know, it's kind of, there's some cool things happening in the gorge. People have planted some really wild things that are probably going to come online this year or next year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, hopefully we can get some cuttings of some aromatic white varietal and some esoteric red varietal that will pr create lower alcohol, higher acid wines, and we can plant them on our vineyard. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't really, I mean, I have ideas of what I want, but I haven't been able to find the vine material yet mm -hmm. for what I want. I'm curious about uh, this, we're right at the end of Harvest 2020 and, and it wasn't really a Harvest 2020 for you. I'm curious what, what this season felt like for you. Uh, you know, I took last year off as well. So, um, so 2018, I scaled back knowing we were going to move and made one red and all the whites um, because I was heavy on reds from the cellar at that point. And then in 19, we're like, not really sure we should make anything. Let's like, you know, so we were able to help our growers place the fruit with other people. And it just kind of worked out that like, all right, we're going to take the year off. We've never had September as a time off. So we actually took a vacation during harvest, um, which was really, really fun to go do something else. And like, you know, fall is my favorite time of year. So everything's kind of in season and you're usually missing it because you're just, your head's in a fermenter. Um, <laughs> So, so I sort of had gone through that already. And so um, this year I think it was more of, maybe I should get some grapes and just do a little bit for us. And then, you know, just things in the world were not um, heading in that direction. And I think given, I mean, we were, we were evacuated once from our property in Mosier this summer in August because of a fire. And then of course we all had to stay indoors for eight days because of the level of smoke. So really glad I'm not dealing with smoke taint again. I'm already going through the 2017 Eagle Creek fire and the impact that that had. I mean, that was a big reason that I wanted to move production out there because the highway got closed in the middle of harvest and we had to drive three hours up and around Mount Hood just to get to and from our vineyards. Um, but also dealing with taint and um, you know, what it's gonna take to make wines that are marketable or the impact if you're not gonna make the wine or dump the wine or didn't pick the grapes. Um, those are all, they're, they're such difficult choices and so impactful for our community. Um, so I really feel for everybody that's struggling with that right now and figuring that out. But um, I'm just lucky that I just timing wise, I, I didn't have a commitment mm -hmm. that I had to go through on during this period. So along the way, you're with your with your wine, with your restaurant, with your with your wine shop, you've, you've received a lot of accolades along the way. I'm, I'm curious what those accomplishments mean to you as you look back. Um, you know, I think the biggest thing really is that customers found us and they continued to come and frequent our businesses, and that kept us going. I mean, that's the the best accolades I think for me are the individual ones from people I know who are customers. Um, and you know, I recently sent out a letter 
um, to my email list, you know, just telling them that I was winding down operations and going to shut down for now, and who knows what the future is. And um, yeah, there's definitely been, you know, a, a good dozen responses that I got that just brought me to tears from the impact that we've had on people's lives um, in the, you know, just their their own experiences of eating and dining and drinking and um, stories that we've shared and whatnot, and um, you know, getting getting named restaurant of the year was great except we had a restaurant that was at 110 percent capacity so it did nothing for us except made it harder um and then the expectations go up and you know the the people that come that it's not for them anyway you have to deal go through that process and that's stressful and challenging as you know young business owners um you know having having the wine shop recognized um multiple times as being you know one of the top ones in town was great because that that was my intent in doing it i felt like you know Retail in Portland had gotten stodgy, and we needed something that was a little bit lighter and fresher. Um, but you know, in the end, uh, the retail business is—it's a hard business. So, in, in, in our marketplace, particularly the way that licensing works here, and the way that we have so many um, mm -hmm. different licensees, you, you can only do so much. Um, so, um, and I feel like you know, the winemaking. I, fortunately, I was really lucky to fall into some fantastic accounts in Seattle, and um, my wines were really well received there and really found the market that I always hoped to find. Um, and Portland was just a lot harder. Um, it's, you know, it's always been a challenging market to sell wine in, and I think it's a challenging market to own a restaurant in these days, and the competition had gotten out of hand, and the turnover of buyers is so high um, and having the consistency and the connection as a you know producer who's trying to sell directly um, you lose a lot of that um, and and there's more people doing it you know I mean this this is where there's a lot of people with small brands out running around showing off their stuff which is awesome um, but competition just mm -hmm. is a challenge so mm -hmm. yeah I'm curious, I want to kind of follow up on something you talked about, the, the responses to your emails and, and, the, and the kind of the, the heartfelt, uh, you know, you talk about the very beginning of your journey as being kind of entranced by food and wine. I'm curious about, as you look back now, the, that, the intimacy of that. Is that something you expected as you set out into restaurants and wine, that the intimacy of the customers and the, people, the friendships you'd build? No, I don't think we really gave that any thought in the beginning. It was like, yeah, let's, you know, like we love going to restaurants and people seem to have a good time when they're dining at restaurants and, you know, it seems like something we could figure out. Let's just do this and it would be a great chance to be an employer and, you know, it, we know that the industry doesn't typically treat employees very well, so let's make sure we go into it with a better philosophy on that. We'll offer health care. We'll do all these things that no one else in the industry does. Those things definitely bit us in the end. Um, we had, you know, phenomenal staff that, you know, when we sold the restaurant 10 years later, um, of the 16 employees, I think 13 of them have been there for eight years or more. Um, but as a result, they were being compensated more than we were. And our health premiums had gone up 10 to 14% every year for a decade. So it's like, who does that? I mean, how do you have one item where the cost goes up 1,000% in a decade? And your menu item might have gone up 3%, 6%, I don't know. Um, really tough, really tough um, lessons. But the interactions with the customers and, and the employees and the relationships we made over the years, I mean, those, they just pay for themselves in spades. And, um, and I think, you know, again, it goes back to Italy um, and, and very different from France, um, is when you go and visit, the hospitality that the Italians share with you is just unbelievable. I mean, we would go vi visit somebody that a supplier said, hey, go meet this guy and they'll show you their vineyard. And we'd spend five to eight hours with them. You know, we'd see the vineyard, then we'd have lunch. Then they'd take us to town to meet a guy that did something that was similar to something we might have mentioned that they thought would be really interesting to us. And then we'd go back and then well, we're going to make you dinner. And then, you know, I mean, and this happened time and time and time again. Um, and in France, we had trouble, you know, like, going beyond the we have you on the appointment you're here at the time it starts and like it's been 23 minutes do you have any other questions it was very interesting um, <laughs> and I think that that Italian generosity kind of was given to us by so many mm -hmm. that we wanted to share that back and um, we were really lucky that we had you know successful businesses that we were able to have mm -hmm. those interactions over time mm -hmm. 
So I know you're kind of at an uncertain spot, but as you look ahead to your future, what do you see? What do you maybe hope for uh, c coming down the line for your for your wine and business journeys? And what do you sort of see as you look ahead? That's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, here we are on November 4th. I think we were definitely looking ahead towards hopefully a new administration, but that doesn't seem uh, like something we're gonna know for a few days or a few months now. Um, and, you know, getting the world back to normal, sensible, um, caring place would be really ideal. And uh, how wine plays a part in the next chapter of my life is really an unknown at this point. Um, you know, in the midst of all of the things that I've mentioned, I was also uh, became a builder and did a lot of kitchen design and remodeling because I was designing and building the kitchens for our restaurants um, and tasting rooms and whatnot and this house and now building another house and so I'm, I've always sort of been torn back and forth between the design build community that's very sustainably focused and winemaking always sustainably focused um, which you know all comes out of my legal background which was environmental law um, so I kind of like have followed that path and I think somehow some way maybe the two will collide down the road um, or both will keep me busy separately in their own way. Um, I would love to you know, continue my efforts in the Columbia Gorge, uh, helping bring awareness to the area. I think that, um, I really do think the Columbia Gorge is the most exciting growing region in the US right now. And it's both a blessing and a curse that it crosses a geographical boundary that's two states because we don't get the full, full support of either state's mm -hmm. wine boards, even though both recognize it and both want to help it, obviously it's tiny, as well as you're splitting dollars, mm -hmm. tax dollars that need to go to earmarked places. Um, and that's made it really hard to get a cohesive story, as well as there's you know no one varietal or anything that you can land on. So I think mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's just education and time and getting people to visit the place and see the diversity and start to appreciate that there's so many different things coming out of there. Um, so if there's a role for me to somehow play with that, whether it's just being the guy at a bar, at a wine bar, like telling that story to other customers who are also there drinking someday when we're all out of stand at wine bars and drink again, um, and maybe it'll be that, or maybe, you know, maybe there'll be some other role that will come around, but um, my eyes are sort of open to that right now and seeing how everything continues to evolve. Mm -hmm. So obviously you've, you've seen a lot of change in the Oregon wine industry, even if you weren't always focused necessarily on Oregon specifically. Sure. I'm curious what the, your kind of initial impressions of Oregon wine the, as an industry was, uh, were, and, and how it's changed now. What does the industry look like now versus when you kind of first became aware of it? Yeah, well having, having grown up in the Willamette Valley and up on Ball Peak and around the, the original pioneers and known what they were doing and seen what they were doing, um, I think I always sort of thought of when I was young, the Oregon wine industry has this, you know, kind of pioneer, little hippie culture that they're doing something with a beverage that America doesn't really understand, but is really cool in Europe. And that's great, but didn't mean much to me. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think, you know, 20 years later when I was running my wine shop and selling a lot of Oregon Pinot Noir and getting to know a big range of producers from those icon iconic producers to you know, up and comers to you know, really young people just making a barrel or two because they're an assistant somewhere. Um, you start to see, you start to see a line that runs through them, but also the differentiation that's possible. Mm -hmm. um, and that it was, it's been great to see people carve out different paths for themselves, even while they're all using the same varietal. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it'll be even more interesting when they branch out and they say. Mm -hmm. It's now okay to plant something that's not Pinot Noir on precious Willamette Valley land because we do have enough of it, um, and it's time to see, you know, what really, what else is going to strike people, mm -hmm. um, and maybe somebody's going to figure out how to, you know, crossbreed a hybrid that's just perfect for Oregon that catches on. I mean, I'm not really sure why that hasn't happened, mm -hmm. um, but you know, like you can look to Austria and. Zweigelt and Saint Laurent and Lafranches and like that kind of thing. Like, you know, is, is there a Pinot Noir mm -hmm. Gamay Blaufrankish kind of thing that can come together or that ripens in a Syrah like climate? 
as we move to a hotter days. You know, like mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. I think there's there's a lot of opportunity for things to to change here. Um, but I think the industry, you know, the other aspect that obviously that's changed dramatically is the the way that tourism and hospitality has emerged, um, and particularly in the last decade. I mean, watching, you know, I think. Maybe the, maybe Brooks was the first one um, that I noticed, and then Ponzi's new place, and to see the level of um, money being spent on tourism and tasting room experience, mm -hmm. as well as education, as well as mm -hmm. you know having a staff that can go beyond just the here's this wine, here's that wine, you know, but actually sit down with people. Um, you know, Adelsheim always does such a great job of that, um, and. And you know you can you can have that and you can have that be super successful, but you can still have the really closed door kind of what I think of as a Sonoma experience, the big table farm where you know you make the appointment, you go, you sit with the actual winemakers and owners, and they share their experience, and then you can buy some mm -hmm. bottles and leave, and and that's that intimate part of the business is so important to so many wine drinkers and often forgotten by people that come to the industry with wealth and just think I'm gonna build a chateau and it's gonna be this many thousands of square feet and we're just gonna put this many people behind the bar and it'll work. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, but that intimate experience and um, that you know meet the farmer kind of mm -hmm. concept, that, I mean, to me that's Oregonian and so mm -hmm. hopefully we don't lose that. Hopefully we don't just become the next Napa because we're different, right? so mm -hmm. it should stay different. Um, but in the outlying areas outside of the Lana Valley, I think you still mostly just find that you know one-on-one -on -one farmer producer experience where you're you're actually meeting the the people who are doing the work, um, uh, and you can appreciate more the challenges that they're facing and they're dealing with, and mm -hmm. hopefully support them and the wines that you like from them. What do you see as you look ahead for Oregon wine? I mean, I think varietal change is definitely. Mm -hmm coming mm -hmm. um, I think you know how long it takes for the Willamette to decide to pivot is big um, because that's where you have established areas um, mm -hmm. already planted mm -hmm. um, yeah I don't know I mean I think I think there's also um, there's gonna be a wave coming of closures and bankruptcies as a result of COVID and as a result of the harsh, harsh impact on the restaurant industry. And I think maybe people aren't taking a hard enough look at the long game on that and are still just gung-ho with production levels that are going to catch up with them. People will run out of space if product doesn't move through the pipeline fast enough. And if there aren't enough businesses to consume, you're not gonna make up for it with, you know, increased wine club sales or even increased, you know, curbside pickup at your own facility. It's just too big mm -hmm. to, to have that happen. So, mm -hmm. so there'll be a shakeout, um, but you know, sometimes that's not a bad thing. Um, there's, there's probably people that have been operating for a long time that maybe don't need to be. And then there's people that really need that ability to do it. That'll finally be able to find some really good equipment and inexpensive rent and maybe some you know fruit to work with that will get them launched that um, we can really see their talents come out mm -hmm. last question for you uh, i'm assuming this is something that's happened to you given your various roles in the industry uh, if someone comes to you and asks you for your kind of words of wisdom about joining the oregon wine industry what do you tell them <laughs> that is a good question um well i i, I think Probably what I do is I start trying to find out what they really know about the industry, how seriously, how serious they are about it, and um, if they know what they're getting themselves into. Because um, selling wine in, in Oregon, selling wine in America, it's a very challenging process. Um, and I think there are so many aspects to it that people don't take into any consideration of, and unfortunately it ends up really stifling them and you know whether it's compliance which is something nobody wants to talk about or deal with but everyone has to um, or it's just you know silly restrictions that you know make things like shipping from one state to the other not just I mean if you've been making widgets your whole life and you're like I'm now I'm gonna make a bottle of wine 
well, I send my widgets to these 50 states and they're all in my country. Why can't I sell? Oh, I can't. Like having that realization, like, there's so many, so many things that um, I would probably just warn them, you know, do a lot of research and really understand like how, how are you going to, once you've figured out how to get your product into a bottle, which is probably the easiest part, because it's really easy to make wine, it's really hard to sell it. Um, then you got to figure out like how is it, how are you planning on this going out the door, you know? Is it all direct? Is it through distribution? Are you going to try to sell yourself, uh, wholesale yourself in Oregon where you're allowed to? Um, those, are, those are big questions that people probably aren't thinking about. They're just thinking, oh, this will be really fun. I'll buy some grapes and I'll ferment it. Um, and trying to get people to just take their time and really think about that and pursue answers to a lot of questions. Um, and especially if they've never run a business before, you know, also just doing some research with, you know, through contacts that you can get through the OLCC and through the, you know, the Department of Revenue and the Secretary of State to just really understand what it means to run a business and the basic things that you should be doing and the employment department. And um, there's so much there that, um, you know, a lot of people come into this business either as business people with a lot of wealth that can work their way through it or as artisans with no wealth. And the paths that they both take are usually going to be very different. Um, but there's room for both to be really successful if they just kind of pay attention to things <laughs> that they might not have a clue about before they venture in. That's good advice. I like that. <laughs> Thanks. That's all the questions that I have for you. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything we didn't cover here that we should have covered? Uh, I feel like we've covered a lot, and I appreciate it. Uh, the time and, well, and the questions. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time and yeah. for your wonderful answers and great stories. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to let you off the hook. All right.